This week, join me in the American Southwest as I explore one of archaeology's greatest mysteries. Why did the ancient inhabitants of this land, the Anasazi, build these incredible cliff dwellings only to abandon them decades later and seemingly disappear from history? Unbelievable. To find out, I'm going to take to the air, dangle from dangerous cliffs, and explore some of America's most spectacular archaeological sites. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. I'll meet you over there. Mesa Verde, southwestern Colorado. Land of rugged canyons, soaring mesas, and some of America's most stunning prehistoric ruins. Yet ever since these abandoned villages were first discovered in the late 19th century, they've puzzled visitors and archaeologists. Pretty incredible, huh? Can you imagine building something like this on the face of a cliff and actually living up here? Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein, and the American Southwest is my home. But I've never gotten to the bottom of its most fascinating mystery until now. Why did the Anasazi decide to move to the cliff sides? And why would they then abandon this entire region only decades later, never to return? These questions are at the heart of a debate now raging between archaeologists and Native Americans. At stake is the traditional image of the peaceful Anasazi. Everyone agrees that's how they began. The people who became known as the Anasazi started to farm this area of the American Southwest as early as 1 AD. For most of their history, they lived in small, scattered villages, on the mesas and in the valleys. But in the middle of the 13th century, something happened. The Anasazi began to cluster together. They built high walls around their settlements, or took the precarious step of moving whole villages onto the cliff sides. Then, fewer than 50 years later, they abandoned these homes too, leaving behind most of their possessions as if they planned to return. Instead, they seemed to disappear from history. Were the Anasazi invaded by another tribe? Or did they succumb to drought? Why did this complex and far-reaching civilization suddenly collapse? What happened? My exploration begins with Larissa Kumawana, a ranger at Mesa Verde National Park. In addition to her years teaching people about these ruins, Larissa is also a member of the Hopi tribe. The Hopi claim the Anasazi are their ancestors, and Larissa's insights may point me in the right direction. So there's no running rivers, no streams in the bottom of any of these canyons. So their main water source would have been seep springs. So there's no water down there. No water the down there. The only water the would be well, in, the see, back in the back of these alcoves here. It is why it's thought that's the reason why the transition happened, you know, from the mesa top sites down into these cliff dwellings. You got the water source right there. Why not build closer to them? Larissa's answer was practical, but I felt it avoided an important question. The Anasazi could have accessed these seep springs without living on the faces of these cliffs. Why subject an entire community to such exposure and risk? Many archaeologists now think that the ancient Anasazi had a darker side, marked by massacres and even cannibalism. Could violence explain the move to the cliffs? The cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde are certainly impressive, but there are hundreds of other sites throughout this region. Perhaps seeing some other dwellings would give me greater insights into why the Anasazi made such a drastic move. To do this, I need a significant change of perspective. This is a twin seat, twin prop, home-built experimental plane. While it might not comply with FAA regulations, its open cockpit makes it perfect for spotting cliff dwellings. These guys are now trying to work out the logistics of uh, where the camera goes and where they fly. 
They don't really seem to care if we live or not. My pilot, Skip Lange. He flew P-51 Mustangs during World War II. Skip, I don't have a parachute. Neither do I, so we're even on that score, Josh. Okay. <laughs> With those encouraging words, we're off. Flying in a plane that feels like it's made of rubber bands and balsa wood. This part of the Southwest is known as the Four Corners, the place where Arizona, Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico come together. It was the heart of the Anasazi homeland for more than a thousand years. Today, most of this region is covered with forests of pinyon pine and juniper. Yet 900 years ago, it was full of fields of corn, squash, and beans. Archaeologists believe the Anasazi supported 40 to 50,000 people in this area. Perhaps Larissa was right. Perhaps some of the Anasazi's water sources dried out, forcing them toward the seep springs. I'm imagining what it must have been like to move off the tops of the mesas and onto the sides of the cliffs. Talk about living on the edge. Think of the children and elderly on these cliff faces. And they did this throughout the Four Corners region, even in some of the most remote and desolate canyons. Why would the Anasazi make such a change, take such a risk, what could these massive stone walls offer them to make the move worthwhile? To answer these questions, I need to get my feet back on solid ground, where I can hike and explore some of the more isolated cliff dwellings. To help me get to these distant dwellings, I'm teaming up with Vaughn Haydenfeld. Vaughn is an accomplished mountaineer and local guide who knows these canyons and their Anasazi sites like the back of his weathered hands. Hey, Vaughn. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How's hey, it going? It's going well. It's a beautiful yeah, day. Good. I heard you're the man who can show me some remote sites. We might be able to find something out here. You got one in mind? Yeah, I do. I'll toss that rope in the back. And... Vaughn spent the last 20 oh. years exploring the ruins of Utah's it's Cedar going. Mesa Plateau. He's played a critical role in the preservation and interpretation of many sites. He's excited to take me to one of his favorites. All right, hold on, this section here looks a little tough. We drive in as far as we can go. The rest will be on foot. Where we're going, it's as if pretty far out there. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's a fairly difficult route in there, so the nice yucca blooms there. Vaughn tells me this plateau is cut by dozens of sheer, slick rock canyons where the Anasazi lived. We'll have to repel to get down into one. All right, here we are. See where we're headed? All the way over there. Yeah. Got that lower set of ruins up against the cliff face. That's incredible. Upper set of ruins. Right up in there. Ah, yeah. oh, right under that cliff. Yeah, yeah. That lift. That's unbelievable. People actually lived. Yes. That high up. <laughs> Apparently so. You know, it's an amazing uh, thing, but people were hunkered all over in these. This is kind of that final phase before the abandonment here. So people are getting defensive and they're starting to hunker into these little spots that have water. They're defending the water. I would think so. I mean, I think that's got to be part of what's going on. You know, that they're here, they've got these towers across here. If you look right across the canyon here, we have a tower, oh. another collapsed tower, you know, showing that they're in control of this little spring here. Let's do it. All right. The watchtowers intrigued me. Uh, I hope so. What were they watching for? One thing that uh, continues to blow me away every time I see these sites is, first of all, how well they blend in to the rocks around them. If you didn't know where to look, you can miss it like that. You never see that thing. And second, why would they build on the face of a cliff? This seems like the worst place to be dragging rocks and making a shelter for the night. Is 
Okay, have you uh, used this tree as an anchor before? No. Here. Okay, seems okay to me. I'm gonna how also... Far, how far down is the uh, drop? That's pretty far down there to me. One of these days, I'll get used to doing stuff like this. Hopefully the rope will get to the bottom. As long as our rope hits. Rope. You know how to buckle it and all that. Have you used this kind of rappel mm -hmm. device before? No, I don't do a lot of rappelling. Uh oh. So, are you comfortable doing this? The walking off the cliff part would be all right. Just but you've never really. I don't usually use a rope. <laughs> I thought you said you've rappelled. Yeah, I have. I just don't usually tie myself in. You feel? Uh, I mean, you guys. This is your your choice here. I mean, this they is, don't care if I die. Yeah. I'm not. Thanks for good you know, TV. <laughs> the trick is, is the the. Uh, do I tell you my? I love you, mom. <laughs> just in case you forgot. The trick is the uh, getting down to the bottom. Have you rappelled down this section before? No, no. I'm, so you don't I don't even know do, when I'm. I don't do that. Yeah, I don't know. What your, uh, but if you get hung up down there, there's not much I'm going to be able to do to help you. I mean, if I think it over my head. Yeah. Or... What else could happen? Flip upside down. Yeah. So just understanding how you know how your descender works. Well, you said it's two ropes that's thick, so it's going to be I'm going to be feeding it through, and if this way I break. Right. On, keep my right. feet wide. Right. Sounds good to me. What the hell? That's why we're here. And with that, I begin my descent. Goodbye, I love you. The really hard part comes halfway down, where the rock face just disappears. One wrong step here, my feet flip over my head, and I'm in serious trouble. I'm in southeastern Utah, rappelling down a cliff face. Just ahead's the lip, the toughest part. Poor footwork here will send my feet flying over my head and I'll be left dangling hundreds of feet above solid ground. I'm past the lip. I can almost hear the sigh of relief from my guide, Vaud Haydenfeld, who's easing me down. Navigating these cliffs gives me a new appreciation for the ancient Anasazi who lived in them. It's their mystery I'm pursuing out here on Utah's Cedar Mesa Plateau. Why did the Anasazi move into the cliffs and then disappear from this area 800 years ago? At Mesa Verde, I learned that Native Americans believe the cause was drought. But some archaeologists think it's a lot more complicated and violent. Look up above, a large spiral. Oh, wow. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, it's an incredible spiral. You know, it's a Really large one, pigment still in pretty good shape. You have a sense of what that meant? The spiral? Yeah, uh, I've, heard, I've heard a lot of different stories. I'm yeah, the, you know, Hopis and people who claim ancestral uh, heritage here uh, have, you know, meanings to it. You know, it might be in a migration or their people. Or... This could just be the, the marker of these people at this site uh, saying, you know, this is us, we're here. Well, the dwelling's just over here this way? Yeah, let's go down and and uh, have a look at the, the best part. We're coming right out to the edge of this ledge, you know, which gets, starts getting that kind of defensive nature. A wall here. And a good, a view, good view of the tower. Greenery there, corn cobs still oh, in the greenery. You see the corn cobs. Yeah. That is incredible. This is amazing. These corn cobs are over 800 years old, and they're still here as if as if they were left just yesterday. Unbelievable. We're coming right out to the edge of this ledge. This is my uh, favorite part of this particular site. This little end ruin. All the rock art images on this whole wall. A large panel we have bear tracks and mountain lion tracks. You've got this bighorn sheep down here. Anthropomorphic figures. Big, long zigzag that comes across this whole entire wall panel. Oh, wow. And here she is. Yep, this is kind of the jewel at the end of, end of the trail. 
Honey, I'm home. Wow. We came down all the way back there. Yeah. But why live here? Why, why build this here? Because I see the tower, right, which we saw on the way down. I guess it's the view. This is, I mean, it's, it's a really, it's a stunning, it's a stunning view, but you now the question that, that, what I don't get is, this isn't easy. You know, they had to, they had to bring these rocks here. If not, if not break them from the wall, then they, there's a lot of work. Yeah. So why, you know, why, why live here? Why bring their babies and their grandchildren to such a precarious location and, and live their lives here? Because something's going on that's forcing them into these kind of situations. Um, and you think that was warfare or well, there was, tribal there was certainly strife unrest, going on. Yeah. There had to have been something to to get people to have to bring their their living up into these kind of places. Mm -hmm. You know, out on ledges. You know, you've got huge drop-offs right out from the, your doorway. Uh, you can't really see. You have to mix mortar, yeah. get water up here to yeah. mix all this mortar to put these stones together. Uh, it's just an amazing amount of effort, and it's not easy, as you can see. Water, the closest water here is down in the canyon bottom. Look at and these holes. They're called loopholes. What are they seeing? This one shows me basically that big rock. Yeah, which right could be there. a route of people coming up into this site. So if you start uh, looking at these, they're called loopholes. If you start yeah. looking through them, a lot of times along walls, they point in different directions mm, and show you things water. happening. So some people would call this a very defensive posturing type of aspect to this architecture. You know, it could be, uh, yeah, you could be looking at your water, you could be looking at a ledge where somebody might come across to, to uh, come into your site, possibly to attack you, whatever. So some people interpret these as, as another kind of defensive type of posturing in, in these loopholed walls. You know, this is kind of the last structure on this whole ledge system. You know, is this, is this the final holdout right here? We don't know. And I'd like to stay longer. The sun's starting to head down over the canyon rim, and we probably ought to start heading out of here. The Anasazi's hideaway so, uh, definitely felt like an outpost or watchtower. But what were they watching for? Vaughn says that their most likely enemy, the Navajo, didn't come to this area for at least another hundred years. In fact, there doesn't seem to be evidence of any other tribes around here in the 13th century. So who was the enemy? I need to find out what was happening to the Anasazi before they moved into the cliffs. It's time to visit an old friend. He's a developer near Cortez, Colorado, just down the road from Mesa Verde. There's no bigger enthusiast about the Anasazi He's found hundreds of ruins on his land, entire villages where the Indians lived before they took to the cliffs. Hi, Josh, how are you? Hi, Archie. Good to be back. Great. You guys have been busy. Oh, we sure have. His name is Come on Archie inside, Hansen. I'll show you what we're doing. You haven't He's seen uncovered this. some okay. pretty Thanks. incredible evidence which could explain what drove the Anasazi to take refuge. A lot of new sites. <laughs> a lot of them, and we've done a lot of work here. How many are you at right now? Well, we're up to about 215 sites across the property right now. And you can come out and Archie's prized site is this partially reconstructed Pueblo that probably housed about 20 people or four families. It was occupied continuously from around 650 to 1150 AD. One of the most fascinating things Archie's found is a maze of tunnels that connect the communal rooms, or kivas, with the other living areas and I've just got to explore where they go. But I find out the hard way how small these people were. The men were about 5'4", the women only five feet tall. Tight squeeze, Arch. At six feet and 180 pounds, I can barely squeeze through. And this is only the beginning of what Archie's excavations have uncovered. Look at all these pot shards. Look at this. And can you imagine? finding this many pot shards, and this is just a small tray sample. Look at these, look at this, look at this corrugated pot. You can imagine finding that, not just on the trail, but on your own property. It's stunning, I, I would be excited. I'd be excited if I just found this piece. But he's got 
buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets. Look at all these studies. Macrobotanical remains, bioarchaeology of disarticulated remains, faunal remains, disturbed sites. He's invested so much time, and the benefit is that all of us get a much clearer picture of who the Anasazi really were. And what Archie and his team of archaeologists have found is far from the traditional image of the peaceful Anasazi. Are you finding any bones in your sites here? Oh, every one. Every, every one. one? Yes, we did. We found several, several bodies over here. We found over in the end one. So the picture here was not one of a peaceful village. Well, that they didn't leave this in a peaceful condition. This is evidently the end of the trip for them. This is death and violence. There were three sunken kivas in this pueblo. They were once the heart of Anasazi communal life. This is beautiful. But they became the scene of horrible massacres with strong evidence of cannibalism. Did you find any bodies or any bones in here? In this particular one, no, but we found some that were in the center one and the other one down at the end. All of them indicated cannibalism? Everyone contributed to it, yes. They were broken up. There are many different signs. The signature of cannibalism is extremely positive. Uh, there have to be uh, uh, seven particularly salient facts there. Oh, there are just to numerize some of them. Pot polish on the end of uh, green strict fractures. They have to have uh, the bones broken open, the marrow extracted from that, bodies disarticulated, heads missing, vertebrae there, no hands, no feet. Unfortunately, this is controversial stuff. Native Americans strongly object to their ancestors being characterized as cannibals. Yet many archaeologists find the evidence in Anasazi sites compelling. They cite signs like pot polish, tiny areas of polish that form when a bone is cooked in a clay pot, and cut marks and abrasions that are identical to those seen on animals which have been consumed. What Archie was saying was that his site is full of such evidence. We, uh, we had a 14-year-old male and an estimated 21-year-old male, and they were butchered and probably consumed down there because they found them on parts and pieces in the fire pit and on the uh, benches going around, etc. We reinterred what we could find in, in that other kiva into the wall. After the massacre, evidence suggests that any remaining residents abandoned this pueblo and moved on. What made them decide as a community, time to go? Well, I, I think that if I was back in that day and age and I had a marauding force come in here and wipe out an entire Pueblo where I was living, uh, stuff bodies in the Kiva and everything else that I would think was a not a very good place to live and I think I would move. I would want more protection. So you're, you're saying that the warfare wasn't internal. There was actually marauders coming into these communities? Well, you've opened a whole <laughs> box of guesses about that one. And my guess would be that they were outside external forces. Was it a neighbor who did not have sufficient food and you had a food supply? Or whether they were people coming from Mexico, which is a big conjecture about this thing at this time. Using Archie's Wi-Fi network, I searched the web for evidence of Anasazi cannibalism. Suspicious bones have been found at about 50 archaeological sites. Not a lot when you look at the whole history of the Anasazi. But the curious thing is that almost all the evidence dates from the same period, beginning around 900 AD and peaking around 1150. These dates correspond exactly to the time when Anasazi civilization was dominated by a place called Chaco Canyon, a city as mysterious as it is grand. It's also in the middle of nowhere. Mutilated bones. Evidence of cannibalism. Everything Archie Hansen said at his Pueblo seems to point to something going terribly wrong in the Anasazi world by the mid-12th century. And the clues to this violence point to Chaco Canyon, the Anasazi's greatest achievement, now a desolate ruin in the New Mexico desert. Bear on Cedar Mesa, I saw some convincing evidence bad. that fear drove the Anasazi into the cliffs. To understand the root of that fear, I have to understand Chaco and what shook the walls of that great stone city. I need to see these ruins from above, so I've called in my friend Bubba Peters with his PPG to help get me into the air. PPG is short for powered paraglider. And Chaco's so big, I need something like this contraption to get the lay of the land. 
but strong winds can make flying tricky, even fatal if I'm not careful. 80 pounds of wind machine. He puts out a 28 horsepower. One small step <sighs> for man. Prop clear. If you can run 30 feet with 80 pounds on your back without getting out of breath, you can fly a PPG. If it's calm, you can travel about 25 miles per hour and stay up for three hours on just four gallons of gas. Pretty economical for views like these. But the fun is flying slow and low. It's amazing how much you can see. That's Chaco. In its heyday, from about 900 to 1150 AD, it was a huge cultural center for much of the Four Corners. People dragged tree trunks for up to 50 miles to erect these enormous buildings. The biggest is Pueblo Bonito. It was four or five stories high with eight hundred rooms. Archaeologists believe that a thousand people lived here in what's been called the largest apartment building in the world until the late 1800s. There's nothing like it in prehistoric North America. Once again, I feel the need to see it up close and on foot. Chaco was much more than just a city. It was a ceremonial powerhouse where people gathered from miles around to worship their gods in great kivas like these. But by 1150, the city was completely abandoned, its inhabitants scattered. Archaeologists are still trying to figure out what went wrong. Was it drought? Too many people with too few resources? Or did something more sinister take place to bring down this great city? The crumbling stone walls don't offer many clues, but the wooden beams might. I've come to one of the only intact rooms left in Pueblo Bonito. Is this really a prehistoric beam? Oh yes, this is the original roof support of this room. Wow. And we're going all the way to the center of the To the log? center of the log, where the Drilling into an ancient roof beam may seem pretty strange. <laughs> but when studying structures like Chaco, this is one of the most important tools archaeologists use. 18 volt DeWald. I'm getting what's called a core sample, a little piece of wood that can help determine when this room was built. Dendrochronology is the science of dating wood by studying tree rings, and nobody knows more about it in the American Southwest than Dr. Jeff Dean. How accurate? I'm just wondering, how accurate is the data? Well, when we take this core back to the lab and analyze it, we can date the year in which the tree was cut down. Really? Yeah, you know, like there is no plus or minus. This is, say, 1120. And it's 1120 and not 1119 and not 1121. Is that far enough? Yes. 10 minutes later, and I've got it. First we take this My own piece of data to add to the scientific record. All right, let me show you what we have here. And if you hold out your hand, we should produce a core oh, from wow. a log. Amazing. It was warm. And you can blow the sawdust away. Mm -hmm. Oop. I dropped the core. Still good. Okay, well, have. let's take that. Turns out, out this light little light sample light. carries an amazing okay. amount of information. Tell me what we got. Yep. Let me show you what we just did in there. This is a cross section of a, another Chaco bean. Mm -hmm. So this core is dated by matching the ring width variability in this sample to ring width variability in this one. So each, let me show you get this. Each ring is a year. Each ring is a year. Big rings mean wet years. Small rings mean dry years. And then by laying this core sample mm -hmm. against it, we can, we can find out. We can find out where the core sample is. Where this is. goes in the, yes. in the years. That's right. And then how do we know what year we're looking at? 
Because is there a master chart that we lay this yes, against? Yes, yes. This, this is part of the master chart, and this series of ring widths in here are compared to those. And once you find a match, you can date the core. Thousands the of core samples taken so, all over the southwest add up to produce a graph you know, charting the annual graph, rainfall from 450 A.D. to the present. So looking at this, was drought the cause of the Chaco decline? Well, it was a major drought, and uh, a lot of people think that drought caused the abandonment of the canyon and the collapse of the system. Do you think so? Well, I think it was part of the equation, but there are other factors involved as well. What were the others? I think it was a combination of drought, adverse conditions in the, in the floodplain, plus the high population. Obviously, these uh, ruins represent a large number of people, so you have these th three factors that combine to uh, trigger the abandonment of the canyon. Drought has always been a fact of life in the Southwest. The people of Chaco Canyon had weathered bad droughts before. And Jeff's tree ring data show that those droughts didn't stop the ambitious building. But in the 1100s, the drought did. Chaco is an eerie place with its own mysteries. Like, how did its priests become powerful enough to get this huge ceremonial center built? Archie Hansen said one theory is that Indians came north from Mexico. Some archaeologists think that they took over Chaco, terrorizing the people. I've been to Mexico. I know that the Toltecs and the Aztecs practiced bloody rituals of human sacrifice. I've seen the skull racks they'd fill with the remains of their enemies. Maybe this could explain why cannibalism suddenly appeared in Anasazi history. But it's just a theory. If only these stones could talk. But the Anasazi left us no written records. Was Chaco the scene of grisly rituals that spread throughout the Anasazi world? Today, some archaeologists are seeking answers to Chaco's mysteries in the smaller communities which help supply the great city. Dr. John Kantner and his archaeology students from Georgia State University are digging at one of these ruins. I'm hoping John will be able to tell me more about what happened uh, nice at Chaco. Uh, what is this site that you guys are excavating? Well, this is a small household. Uh, this community here, which we call Blue Jay Community, probably had three dozen of these small households, maybe four dozen of them. And Chaco is 50 miles. Yeah, it's a give or take. It's a right, exactly that it's way. Maybe, exactly. How then? How then does this site give you clues into the rise and fall of Chaco culture over there? Chaco Canyon has very little of, of its own in the canyon. Uh, there is a little bit of water there. They certainly could support some farming. But as far as other resources, there's just not, not a lot that's there. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's one of the most desolate places you'll find in the entire Pueblo and Southwest. These communities over here are much better positioned. There's a bit, it's a bit wetter here. There's more raw stone materials. There's more wood. And so these people here were the ones that were carrying a lot of the goods into Chaco Canyon to fuel it. Everything that Chaco did had to be fueled by people coming from outside of the area. People in small villages just like this. So the people here have what they need. People here have what they need, exactly. And what does the Chaco culture have that these people need? Yeah, that's a great question. That's what we're sort of trying to figure out exactly. Uh, I think that most archaeologists would agree that Chaco eventually becomes a pretty powerful pilgrimage center, one espousing a religious belief uh, that these people seem to, to uh, adhere to. What the Chacoan's religion was, nobody knows for sure. Many archaeologists believe it had a dark side. That could explain the instances of cannibalism and why people would walk 50 miles just to get close to its power. People uh, believe so much in whatever it is that Chaco is doing that they're willing to carry goods to Chaco, fuel its, uh, its very existence. And then I think Chaco Canyon began to do what we anthropologists call materialize that religious belief system. And by materializing, what they do is they create things. You create things, and if those things are important for the, for the religious belief system, for the rituals, for the ceremonies, then that means that it can be controlled. Other people need those things. Turquoise and shell, and for people out here, they felt they needed those things. 
And so in order to get those things, they had to go there, and they probably then brought things to Chakra Canyon in exchange for just a little piece of that belief system, a little piece of the religion that they can bring back here to their small communities and then help to fuel what they thought was going to be success here. As I look around John's dig, I'm reminded again that archaeology is painstaking work, piecing together answers from bits of pottery, turquoise, and bone. The simplest of questions can often take years to answer, and even then there's always room for debate. John, you've given me a good sense of how this community related to the Chaco culture, but how did it all fall apart? Well, the priestly leaders of Chaco Canyon, their power and authority was based on a belief system, and that's really all they had. So it's really a house of cards, and if any of those cards are removed, then the whole thing comes falling down. Which was the one card then that did that? In the early 1100s, there was a, a drought. It was a relatively minor drought, particularly in comparison to other droughts that Pueblo people have experienced. Mm -hmm. But it probably was just enough to cause the problems. But essentially, there's a power vacuum, and that leads to a lot of social chaos. But did social chaos mean violence? I asked John, was this what drove the Anasazi to take refuge in the cliffs? In certain parts of the Puebloan world, that's exactly what happens. The violence and the, and the strife that results from this power vacuum leads people to retreat into those kinds of refuges. Moving north to places like Mesa Verde. Exactly. What John says makes sense. Think of the thousands of people abandoning Chaco, looking for shelter elsewhere in the Four Corners. Competition must have been fierce. It's not hard to imagine that it was brutal, too. It's time to put the pieces of the mystery together. But there's one last clue I need to explore. At John Kantner's dig, I learned that many archaeologists believe that the fall of Chaco Canyon around 1150 AD brought social chaos and violence to the Anasazi world. That's about the same time cannibalism peaked and when Archie's Pueblo experienced its brutal massacre. Is this the answer to the Anasazi mystery of why they moved into the cliffs and then abandoned the Four Corners? Yet there's another side to this story. Indians to the south of the Four Corners claim to be descended from the Anasazi. The Pueblo, the Zuni, and the Hopi have their own oral histories about their ancient ancestors. I've spoken to one Hopi at Mesa Verde, Larissa Kumawana, who told me that the Anasazi moved to the cliffs to be closer to their water sources. Now I'm going to hear more of the Hopi side of the story. I've come to southeastern Utah to the San Juan River to take a trip and take a look at their rock art. There's a few petroglyphs just downriver from us. And to see if I can get a feel for the culture, I've arranged for some Hopi elders to take a ride down the river with me. Hi. Hello. You... Wilton. Wilton Kuyabuhema and Dalton Taylor nice are elders you. from the Hopi Reservation in Arizona, hey, Dalton. Hi, Dalton. south of the nice Four Corners. You. Dawa Taylor Dawa. is Dalton's Hi, son. Nice to meet you. Native Americans who claim ancestral ties with the Anasazi are very hesitant to share their clan histories. It's private, and out of respect, I'm cautious with my questions. Do you, do you have a personal perspective on the Anasazi and what they did out here? Uh, the Anasazi, um, I think we have a, I think there's, there's one misunderstanding about the word Anasazi. Yeah. And in Hopi, we call them Hisatsino. Hisatsino. Yeah, people of the past. The term Anasazi isn't exactly popular among people who claim to be their descendants. That's because it's a Navajo word that means ancient enemies. Today, many prefer to use the term ancestral Puebloans instead of Anasazi. We near a bend in the river. The elders are quiet, so I'm quiet too. But I'm hoping that the petroglyphs we'll soon see will be enough to set them talking.
we pull up to take a look at some petroglyphs. Life-size figures pecked out by the ancient Anasazi 1,500 years ago. But they're just too old. The Hopi can't interpret them. Yet nearby are some other petroglyphs they find very Looks familiar. Like there's something right here. Oh yeah, that's the spiral. That's the spiral. Uh, that's a migration story right there. Migration. Excuse Maria, me. come on up. So here, they, they occupy, this is the center where they occupied it. Mm -hmm. And when they go, they go this way. To the Hopi, the spiral means their people were once here, at this place in the Four Corners. To them, the Anasazi mystery is simply a story of migration. They abandoned the area because it was time for them to go, not because of social chaos or violence. Looks like there's a head here. It takes several hours, but I finally feel comfortable enough to ask Wilton the toughest question of all. Wilton, were the Anasazi cannibals? No. Not, not really. How do you know? Uh, because from the time when the migration started a long time ago, there is no enemies. Until the second group, like Navajos and these other Paiute, they're the ones that come in and doing the warfare with the, with the Hopi people. Because of this? To the Hopi, yeah, there were no enemies before the Navajo. It's not a new one. And they didn't come to the Four Corners until long after the Anasazi were gone. But what if the enemy wasn't an invader? And the other one is, uh... I remember what Vaughn said to me on that remote ledge in Cedar Mesa. My opinion, there was, there was all sorts of sub conflicts going on. Probably, my guess is, among people living here, not outside forces necessarily. Some people do think that there was an outside influence of other people coming in and putting pressure on these people. But my guess is it's probably people, you know, maybe in the next canyon over. As I learned from Vaughn, Archie, and John Kantner, violence and probably warfare drove the Anasazi into the cliffs. But it's most likely that their enemy was none other than the Anasazi themselves. As for the second half of the mystery, the Hopi story of migration fits. The Anasazi didn't disappear. They simply left the Four Corners. The tree rings show that a great drought descended on this area in the late 13th century. Weary from decades of fighting, the survivors most likely did what their ancestors had done ages before. They migrated south to begin a new life. On our last stop, we visit the River House ruins. It was a sacred place for the ancient Anasazi. It still is for the Hopi today. We make an offering of cornmeal. New evidence may one day settle the issue. But for now, archeologists and modern Puebloans continue the debate searching for clues left in the steep stone walls of America's Red Rock Canyons.